Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Office Hours. Uh, I am Sunil Gupta, I am your host. Um, I'm so excited to be back. Uh, we have a really exciting episode. Uh, just for those of you who are joining Office Hours for the first time, uh, let me give you a little bit of a sense of what we do here. We, um, we interview thought leaders, experts, um, entrepreneurs who uh, are able to come onto the show and really share their expertise with us. And specifically about sort of this just fast paced changing world that we live in right now. Um, what does it mean to be an entrepreneur today? How do we succeed? What are the challenges and obstacles that are in our way? And um, today we have a very, very special guest. Uh, his name is Nick Stone. He is, he's become a friend of mine, um, but he's also the CEO and founder of Bluestone Lane, uh, which many of you probably sort of know about. Uh, Bluestone Lane started out 10 years ago uh, as an Australian-owned inspired cafe, um, and it is now in over 60 locations, and it's still growing. Uh, Nick and I had a chance to get to know each other a little bit through um, another project with American Express. Um, which is the series, Business Class, the series. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that before we hang up today, before we end the show. Um, but just an amazing person. And I'm about to add him right now. He has taught me so much. So let's see if he is here. And we'll, we'll start our show. Here he is. Nick. Sunil, how are you? Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> great to be here. It's good to see you again. Really, really great to see you. Um, you know, there's so much as like with all of our conversations, Nick, there's too much to discuss for one block of time. So we have to focus. <laughs> what I think we can do is I want to talk about sort of a couple of things in particular. One is how do we find sort of our market? You know, how do we really sort of know what our focus is and how do we assess whether our market makes sense so that we can actually prioritize what's happening there? And the second thing that I think that you, you have a lot of insights on is about inspiring a team and keeping a team motivated, even through the difficult times. Okay, so those are kind of the two big topics. But before we get there, can you just, for those of us that aren't aware of Bluestone Lane, can you tell us a little bit about the brand and, you know, what it means to you? Sure, sure thing. Well, thanks again for having me on and great to connect with Sony people on the American Express business IG platform. Uh, I'm originally, as you can tell from the accent, I'm originally from Melbourne, Australia, and I'm relocated to uh, the US, New York in 2010. And uh, when I got here, I just couldn't believe how different the coffee culture was. Uh, I come from a Melbourne, very sophisticated cosmopolitan city, mm. uh, known for arts, known for its culinary and known for its coffee culture. It's, it's a market in Australia where the big chains actually have, have been unsuccessful. So when I moved, I just thought there must be this opportunity to try and bring what we do so well, where getting coffee is not about consuming a product. It's about connecting with a place, with the way make, the proprietors make you feel or with friends or family. So that was that customer centricity really unlocked the idea because I'd never spent a day in hospitality prior to starting Bluestone. And, uh, you know, that's, I was solving an unfulfilled need for myself and for my wife. And uh, Bluestone Lane was born in a little subterranean basement in Manhattan with no street visibility, no signage. And uh, it just sort of grew from there. Yeah. So it sounds like it was much more about the culture than it was about anything else. The feel you want people to have when they walk in. Yeah. I th for us, the human connection and the hospitality, making someone feel good, that daily ritual was more important than the absolute product. Of course, I, I, I missed really well artisanal, high quality coffee, mm. but you can, you can find ways to, to make a great product it, through uh, asking the right questions, buying the right equipment, sourcing the right product, mm. whether it's beans, milk, it's quite linear. You're gonna be able to eventually solve that. But the hospitality, the DNA, the way we, we wanted to have locals, not customers. And what does that essentially mean? It means that you have this reciprocal relationship where you walk in and the proprietor of the team know your name, face and order. And if you have that level of acknowledgement or engagement or recognition, quite commonly, the, the customer or the local in our case is going to say, oh, what's your name? And just through, through that simple act, you develop this connection. 
connection. And then coffee is so ritualistic. It's, it's a daily consumed, in most cases, uh, beverage. So you get these chances to, to really retain locals. You don't have to constantly acquire them because once you have someone that becomes a local, they'll probably be loyal and come five days a week. They might come seven days a week in the case of Bluestone Lane. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Uh, locals, not customers. When, when you were sort of thinking about, all right, I miss Australia's coffee shops and I would like to have one of those in my own backyard. Was there also sort of a sense of, okay, but you know, there, there are big chains here and there are a lot of coffee shops, especially in New York where you were based. While it might be a good idea, I don't know if it's actually a good business. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, I think you're right. There's two massive incumbents and we won't mention their names, uh, but uh, one's from Seattle and one's from the Northeast. And you know, 70% of all coffee shops are, are one of those brands. So if anything, the market opportunity, the addressable market, the white space was clearly very, very large because they'd been so successful. So whether there was a, a, a consumption, a consumer base or a consumption there, that was validated. So my opportunity was really to sort of find a niche where I thought that this core customer might be really, really interested in better quality coffee product, probably more fresh freshly made healthier food options rather than packaged and frozen and processed out of a commissary. But ultimately I think, and I'd seen this and I felt it myself with this rapid rise in digital connectivity and which had been obviously accelerated dramatically because of the consequences of COVID and the way that we lived and, and worked, uh, that there was this need for more human connection where you walk in and someone just acknowledges you and makes you feel good. So if we could focus on those three elements rather than just product, I felt that that is going to be a really authentic acknowledgement to the Australian coffee culture. And I, I was really confident that there must be people that are looking for that, that want to come in with their kids, that want to come in with their partner, that want to go before they go to the gym or after they drop the kids off the school. And they want, they want to be acknowledged and known that, that we care about them and it's not just shoveling out product. And that's what I was experiencing in New York. And I thought, there's got to be a different way here. And, and uh, that's, you know, after sitting on our hands and um, observing and doing a tremendous amount of research, we finally launched after uh, three years living in New York City. Incredible. Yeah. Well, you know, I also, I just want to remind anybody who's tuning in right now, that uh, this is a collaborative discussion, community discussion. So add your comments, add your questions down below. We're monitoring them. You'll see me tilting my head to look a little bit at this screen here. Uh, my team is helping me sort of bring those questions into the conversation. So uh, add them below, ask your questions. I know I have a lot of questions for Nick. Um, well, Sunil, I've, I've got a lot of coffee. <laughs> so, you know, absolute blatant product placement, but I'm gonna be fueled the right way. So I can, you... I'm, I'm good for... <laughs> Good for the whole session. I'll be amped up. <laughs> <laughs> what are you drinking right now, Nick? I'm actually having a magic. So uh, it comes in an eight ounce cup, this one here. Yeah. But uh, it's basically equal parts espresso and equal, equal parts textured milk. So it's like mm. a, a small flat white. Yeah. So flat white is six ounces of well, the way we serve it, six ounces of milk, two ounces of coffee. This is more like so two and two or, or two and three. Okay. Yeah, a little bit sharper. <laughs> Okay, so no, it's so interesting because uh, I didn't really know about the flat white, okay? And then all of a sudden, I come to Bluestone, I discover flat white, but then I also realize that flat white is sort of kind of everywhere. W was this something that you brought to the market here? Well, I, I think it's a tremendous acknowledgement to Australian and New Zealand coffee culture because outside of Australia and New Zealand, all Australian owned businesses, or New Zealand owned businesses operating internationally, you couldn't find a flat white. But when Starbucks put it on its core menu, which was I think about in 2015, that was a massive acknowledgement mm -hmm. towards uh, the coffee cultures down under. Uh, and you know, flat white didn't originate in the UK and didn't originate in France or Italy. It, it, genuinely came from Australia and New Zealand. Now, how the, how the flat white's made in some stores is a bit different from how we make it, but ultimately I do think it's a tremendous acknowledgement to, to this quality of beverage. And, you know, I, for us, it's so popular. Of course, lattes are popular, but there, a lot of our locals love drinking the more 
like quintessential Australian cafe beverages, things like a piccolo, uh, a magic, a properly made flat white. So an Aussie ice latte even. So it's, uh, you know, it's wonderful to be able to share in those experiences and provide someone with a, a new taste, a, new, a, a trial, try something new. Yeah. That's, that's an incredible amount of reward, intrinsic reward you get from being involved in a tangible retailer hospitality business. I think you even, you've even tried your first piccolo at Bluestone uh, a few months ago, Sunil. You made me my first piccolo <laughs> and, it was, and it was incredible. It was incredible. Yeah. And, I've, and I've gone back many times since and had the same thing. But, you know, I got to say, Nick, the way you made it, or it, it, was, it was special. Can, <laughs> can, let me, can let me ask you this? Because I think that this is a part of your story that is, that is not as well known. You're obviously an entrepreneur who's had a tremendous amount of success but Bluestone Lane really started as a side hustle. You, you actually had a full-time job when you were starting out and you kept that full-time job for quite a while. Can you just take us back to that time and tell us how that was all sort of working out in your in your day-to-day -day life? You're quite correct. I, I moved to New York in 2010 as part of my postgraduate studies and I was able to be transferred with the bank I was working uh, at in in Melbourne, so I was in finance, and New York was the mecca. I always wanted this opportunity to live in the world's uh, greatest city. It what felt like the center of the universe. And uh, but you know, during business school, I, I that was when I was observing how different the coffee culture was, and people were going out to get coffee, and I'd ask them like, "Well, where do you go?" And they sort of just say, "Oh, they just go wherever it's convenient." And that was so different from me. Like, I would walk an extra 500 meters a kilometer to go to my place where, I, where they knew me and made me feel special. That was more important, that acknowledgement recognition piece was more addictive than the, the caffeine and the beverage, in fact. Mm -hmm. So for, for, for me, I just started to realize that uh, I've got to do something. I, I just kept becoming, a, you know, I dived into it with such a um, tenacity about becoming a student of the industry because I had no experience. I'd never worked in hospitality, but I had that customer centricity of what I was looking for, what I missed. And then, yes, I was very fortunate. I had business acumen that I'd worked with companies and I'd worked in uh, the banking finance industry where you look at how companies create value and how they manage risk and how they grow and fund their growth and how they get themselves in trouble. But let's, and let's, yeah, let's dig, let's dig into the, the one part that you just mentioned, though, to become a student of an industry, because I think that's so interesting. You know, I talk to entrepreneurs all the time or petite, people who want to be entrepreneurs because they're interested in a particular craft. However, they don't necessarily have a lot of experience in that. And it sounds like that was very much the case for you. You you were interested in coffee shops. You didn't have experience with hospitality. So what did it mean specifically for you to become a student of an industry? It's an excellent question and you're precisely right. Like I had an unfulfilled need. I didn't have this massive interest in becoming a barista. I, I wanted to solve that, that hole I had every day where I'd walk in and I'd feel like I was part of the community. And that's where I thought the opportunity was. I, I, I know how to play my role in a team. I love being part of teams. I think I can design a team that when we come, when people come, they, feel like locals, not customers. Mm. So what I did as a complete outsider is I, I just dived in, I approached it through the lens of customer centricity and I dived in it as a student. So being as inquisitive as possible, networking and asking people to take a moment to catch up for a coffee or a drink or a run to ask them questions. Because what these I find- other, These are other owners, these are other coffee shop yeah, owners. That, yeah. yeah, certainly. And, what I've been really fortunate to, to experience, and, and this is a critical thing that I love paying it back, is when people ask to meet with you, they generally say yes. They're generally very flattered that you enjoy their business or you're a fan of their business or a customer and you'd like to learn more. I don't find typically that people are very protective. And it's a beautiful human trait. And I, and I found that... Um, to be more pronounced in the US, actually, in the United States. It's a wonderful thing to ask someone, would there be a chance that I could catch up for 20 minutes and pick your brain on how you grew your business or how you manage this challenge? And through aggregating those insights and, and those learnings, I was able to assess the value proposition like reasonably objectively, like look at the business objectively, how are we really going to market 
why would that local stay with us? Would they pay more? Would they pay less? What are they looking for? What, what goes into a great experience? What are the steps of service? Mm. And through that, you start also to write down mitigants or, or ways you can address challenges. And mm. through that process, I gain enormous amount of confidence. So as an example, uh, if we run out of cups, what would we do? We, if you suddenly go, okay, well, I would go to the supermarket here or I'd source them from my neighbor or I'd, and suddenly you, you gain a lot of confidence because you, you're thinking about everything that could go well, but certainly things that might not go well. And I found through that process of just becoming an objective student that uh, I gained more confidence and conviction that I can, I can do this and I can lead a team and get everyone on the, on the bus and drive them towards the, the North Star. So that, that's what I did to approach it as a complete outsider that never worked a single day in hospitality. Yeah, that I certainly that. spent a lot of time in hospitality, uh, in, uh, you know, stores and pubs and cafes and restaurants, but I'd never been involved myself. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Nick, we have some questions coming in. I'm, I'm right about to hop to them, but I, I want to ask you about <laughs> something you just brought up because on the one hand, what I'm hearing is like, hey, customer service is so important to you, right? Like paramount ultimately. Yeah. And at the same time, you have to be willing to, to have things not go well, right? In order to learn, in order to grow. But was that ever a fear for you that like, hey, if I'm so customer centric, I don't want to mess up a single experience because if I do, then I'm letting down my vision. That's the biggest challenge we have at Bluestone Lane, delivering into that, that brand promise. Uh, we present ourselves as a human connection company of course, we facilitate that connection through serving delicious coffee and food and creating a you know, really warm and I think inspiring atmospheres, beautifully designed spaces, great music and creation. But yeah, that is the biggest challenge. You know, how, do you, how do you govern a lifestyle brand that's trying to achieve this ambitious goal of boutique at scale? Mm. Because we don't see ourselves as a chain. There's no two Bluestone Lane stores that look the same. We have certain elements that are, that are uniform, that are really important to the local, that the coffee tastes the same, that it comes out at similar speed. And we're always working on that consistency, but we need to ensure that we remain curated and where you walk into your local and Sunil, you have your local and John or Sally have their local and I have my local store where I know the team and I love the menu and I love the environment. So you, you, there's, that is the biggest challenge, but ultimately there's some things that we've done to try and drive that awareness and to have that accountability across the team that they feel responsible to deliver into the promise. Yeah. Yeah. So questions that kind of came in. So one, one that's kind of, I think top of mind is how do you know, what are some factors for a small business owner to consider when they're really thinking about finding their focus? Because for you, it's, it seems like you did that really well. So if I'm kind of like really trying to analyze a market and find what my focus is, what are some of the most important factors I need to keep in mind? I, I think less is more is a beautiful statement when you're trying to find focus. It's, and it's also very easy to be knocked off course because naturally when your friends and family become quite enthused or they feed off your enthusiasm or excitement, they can stimulate a lot of ideas, which are welcomed, but it doesn't mean that you have to react and respond and implement. Mm. You need to be really, really sure on what, who's your core customer and what's our value proposition. And, and I think that through that framework all the time of you know, would the core customer value this? Can we do execute and deliver on the proposition? You, you'll, you'll start saying no to a lot more and saying no is very challenging. I found that myself because when people are positive about what you're doing, it's easy to just get caught up in the moment. Yeah. So for us, um, we started with a quite narrow focus. We were, we were opening, going to open a couple of coffee shops in the bottom of office towers because yeah. back then in 2013, we thought that people going to work in office towers was very stable, very predictable. It was, almost like an annuity. And uh, that was the discipline. And we had opportunities to open in suburbs or, and we just kept it 
simple and refined where we could control the experience and focus on the execution. There's a, there's a fantastic statement uh, and it's important to sort of always, I found to keep this in mind and I discuss it with my team is that no one owns a good idea. Execution is everything. Mm. And you're, don't, don't, const, don't constrict your thoughts or I, I encourage my team to come with big ideas, come with bold ambitions. But we often need to think of it through the prism of like, what can we really execute? Do we have the capability to do it with given the team, given our resourcing mm. and given what our core customer and our value proposition is? Yeah. Well, another question came in kind of about this subject of growth that I think we're starting to get into, which was like, was there a moment when you actually started to feel like, wow, we're really growing? Yeah, you know, I think I think when scaling a business is a bit like driving a Formula One car where you you need to be a little bit borderline out of control to win, but you can't afford to crash. And I've found that with Bluestone that at times that we've been growing too quickly mm. and I'm, I'm focusing on what I can control and I'm remaining very upbeat. But in my gut, I feel like this is getting a little bit wobbly. I just got to make sure that I'm doing playing my role and encouraging the team to, to remain focused and believe that we can do this. And, so and what happens, uh, sorry, on that note, Nick, what, what, so what happens like when things start to feel wobbly, what are you noticing around you? You, you, you'll generally see that there's a lot of, there can be different fractures within the group. There can be uh, doubts. There can be negativity that creeps in. Mm. Uh, there can be frustration. Uh, you know, of course, just some of those more common you know, uh, symptoms like blaming and, and uh, tension. And uh, so, you know, they're quite, and then uh, you, for us, because of being a retail hospitality business, you can see some tangible effects. The in-store experience deteriorates. We're struggling to hire. We're struggling to train effectively because we're scrambling. There's some metrics that we can, we can track and there's just some ob observations that are, pretty tangible you can see that wow they, they don't have it all dialed in and uh but there's things you can do now that we've learned and at bluestone that we've applied uh to try and deal with those moments where it, it where it feels like it's wobbly it's a bit unstable and uh you know for myself personally when i'm feeling uncertain or anxious that something that i do is is i so i vocalize with an inner inner circle some, some family and some friends and business colleagues that I really trust and I bounce around ideas and I find like talking about it and just socializing it frames my thoughts and gives me direction and also re-energizes like my inner confidence that we can do this and mm. we will find a pathway forward we've we've done it before and there's a there's a playbook and there's a method and uh, I just assuming good intent uh and remember remaining positive and focus on what you can control has really, really helped myself. And, and, uh, we try and instill that all the time to the Bluestone Lane team. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, it's been amazing to, to just watch the growth of Bluestone Lane. And, you know, I mean, because in the beginning you were kind of thinking, here's a couple of coffee shops and, and all of a sudden now you're, you're way over 60 from a pandemic, like to an uncertain economic climate all of these things sort of impact our growth strategy. So can you talk a little bit about like what the past few years have been like when it came to you sort of thinking about growth? Yeah, well, it's been an extraordinary change and transformational really uh, with COVID and given Bluestone Lane's real, real estate proposition. So our footprint was very much focused on inner urban cities. So from Boston through to DC and then from San Francisco through to LA. So we were very much uh, concentrated on these inner urban cities and our whole coffee shop model was to put coffee shops at the bottom of office buildings. Mm. So when COVID hit, uh, we had a very precarious footprint. We were in a really tough spot. Most of our locations had to close, but we didn't, we didn't want them to close. We wanted to preserve jobs. We wanted to give the local community a beacon of hope that they could leave their apartment or home and walk in and, and, know that they can they're welcome and even though we're wearing masks that there's still that warmth and 
and connection. And then thirdly, like, we wanted to remain open for healthcare heroes that were just doing the most extraordinary job and they were working harder than anyone and putting their body and, and their lives on the line to save others, which is just so inspiring. So what the team did was just truly extraordinary. So during that period where uh, we have been so much, we've been so focused on the human connection and the in-store experience and that recognition piece. And we had to leverage digital in a really, really big way. Mm. Prior to COVID, uh, we had less than 5% digital sales. We had no ability to order on an app, order mm. ahead or order delivery. Uh, we had no ability to order at the table. Uh, so what we did is we were working in the background uh, in the, not anticipating COVID, but just anticipating what, where, how the consumer is going to change or how a cool customer is going to want more uh, autonomy and they want to be empowered to, to order and pay how they'd like to have that agency. We, we actually decided within about a few weeks of COVID, say March 13, when I think the national emergency was declared, we went to 100% digital. Mm. So we went from 5% to 100 And that showed us a new way that really got us exposed to what the future state would be in hospitality, where it's blending uh, hospitality and human connection, but also with the convenience of digital ordering. So if you need to grab something really quickly, it might be better to order it ahead. If you are a local and you're really familiar with the menu and you know what you want to order, maybe you want to be acknowledged when you walk in, but you just want to press a button. Mm -hmm. Maybe when you come dine, I know for myself, when I dine with my kids, we speed, um, speed is so important. The kids have probably got 45 minutes in a Bluestone max before mm -hmm. they start throwing avocado smash against the wall. Mm -hmm. So getting that order on really, really effectively and efficiently via an app and paying worked really well. Did you, did you feel at all like with this, with, with the increase in digital, you were losing some of the human connection that kind of drove you to start Bluestone Lane in the first place? I think we did lose a little bit of that human connection. It was almost a necessity because of the restrictions around um, social you know, gatherings and, and uh, just respecting people's space, particularly through till say uh, mid to 2021. Uh, after that, I think there was a little bit of confusion between the digital process and what I'd call a sort of analog old school menu. And we've just found a hybrid and now it's all about providing as much agency and empowerment to the local so they can decide how they want to order. They want to order exclusively with one of our service professionals, a barista. Fantastic. If they would like to order on their phone via the app and accrue loyalty and have that transparency on what they're spending. Fantastic. If they want to just order on the way to work where they just jump out of the car or they walk in out of the office building, they have that opportunity. So for us, it, it transformed our insights into our locals because the loyalty program drew, uh, grew so transformationally. Mm -hmm. And we have greater um, insights into what they're ordering, when they order, what locations they visit. And that enables us to reward and tailor offerings and develop limited time offers yeah. that drive engagement and uh, reward. Yeah, that's great. And a related question to that, one, somebody asked, when you were growing the business, you had actually made a decision to go cashless early on, maybe earlier than the, the others. Were you worried when you made that decision about losing customers in that transition? I, well, I think it's a really interesting question. Uh, cashless for us, we have found that over 95% uh, it was more like 98% of all transactions were cashless. And we found that cash was leading to a number of other issues. Mm. Um, there was, there was theft, there was management, there was, um, there was a whole host, but, mm. uh, and also people didn't want to really carry cash during that period of COVID. You know, they, they wanted to have as limited amount of sort of touching as possible. So we remained really focused on digital and, uh, and you know, our core customer is primarily a millennial that is aged between 20, let's say 23 through to 41. That's 90% of our customers and 65% are young women. And how they were paying was via their app, via Apple Pay or other brands of Amex or so what have you. So it was just, that's the way that we were focused. So um, yeah, you know, for us, 
uh, that's what we did. But now the majority of our locations, if not all our locations, except cash, it remains such a small part of the business. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to get a, a little bit to sort of team motivation as well, because I think that's something that I know you take, you know, I think you think about it in a really deep way, especially because so much of what Bluestone Lane stands for is customer service. I also want to talk before we get there, though, about sort of how you motivated yourself, because again, this and this always blows me away. You were in a pretty demanding job. You were working as an investment banker on Wall Street. These are pretty long hours that were expected of you. And literally on the side, you're building Bluestone Lane. So, you know, how did you how did you make it work? Like what what was your like tell me about your schedule? It was a juggle, certainly a juggle. But it was something that I was really so passionate about and part of it became my hobby that building Bluestone Lane was was this side hustle that I was really passionate about. And the tangibility you get from being in the retail industry is quite magical mm. because you can work on a business and you open and and a customer can walk in straight away and they can tell you or they can give you feedback dynamically that they're having an amazing experience or that, that they don't like this, but they like that. And that's really quite addictive when, when uh, you can build something and get immediate customer feedback. Of course, some days it's, it's hard to take, <laughs> take the feedback and you might disagree with it, but nonetheless, you've got to respect it. And I, I think that, I just started, I was, a lot of people are saying that they were, they were loving the experience and they were looking for something that aligned with our proposition, great coffee, great food, great hospitality. And, you know, I just, I just kept going with it, but it's like anything. If you, if you've got a hobby, you find ways to allocate time. Mm. So for me, it was working on the weekend. It was working early in the morning and I need, really need to focus on building a team because the day to day execution that needed to be taken care of by the team. And my role was very much trying to recruit, uh, define the values, recruit alongside those values. And so the team members are aligned and I would try and get out of the way as much as possible. I would provide sort of the brand architecture, you know, the products, the proposition, the real estate, those like core tenants to enable us to, to have a chance to execute. And then you know, provided that autonomy that the team would and trust that the team would do an amazing job. And that's been this, I, I couldn't really add a lot of value early in, in the early days because I didn't come from hospitality background. So I, I really had to observe and learn myself. And I think it was a lot more beneficial that, that I wasn't full time out of the gate, the business. I didn't know if I'd be, you know, that productive to be honest, because it was small, and the most critical people were, were those uh, teammates making the locals feel special. And that, that still remains the case now. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I work with the team on making sure that we're set in the right direction and that we have the right proposition and that we are recruiting talent. But the, the, those who make the difference, who make our locals feel really special, who turn around a really challenging evening by that warmth and smile and, and great coffee in the morning are our teammates. And, they're the ones that uh, I'm so enormously grateful uh, to have as part of the business and, and what they've done, they've built Bluestone. So yeah, yeah forever yeah. grateful. And I think it's interesting because when we think of sort of entrepreneurship, sometimes, you know, the, the, the perception can be, we've got to sort of abandon our current life in order to sort of make entrepreneurship work in order to sort of go all in with something. But it sounds like you, you, you went all in with Bluestone Lane without having to abandon where you were what what did you see to be the biggest benefit of that? Or if you're, if you're sort of talking to a potential entrepreneur, what are some things that they would need to consider when it comes to sort of like abandoning your job or like leaving your job versus continuing to keep your salary and build this on the side? Yeah, I have, I think I have a bit of a contrarian view to some entrepreneurs around building businesses and, and the entrepreneurship movement. I, I don't, I think you need to, assess whether you can afford given your uh, financial commitments or your lifestyle commitments or your family's commitments or responsibilities and whether you can just go all in. And for myself, I thought it would be better to go a bit slower mm. and to, to learn and be, be really methodical and maybe sort of 
crawl, walk, run than crawl, run. And uh, I, I just also assessed, I, I guess I had enough um, introspective to introspection to sort of assess, like maybe I can't add that much value early on. You know, I might be a distraction. I might be a negative for the business because I might push it in directions or ways that are not overly conducive or not supportive of where we're at in our life cycle. So I, I think that you want to be really careful. I think there's nothing wrong with doing it on the side, learning, learning. And when you finally get the confidence and you know that it works for your um, economic situation or your lifestyle or your family, then you jump in with more confidence. And that's what I found. I, because if you if you go into a a new venture where you you know you're still in the iteration phase and you're learning, but you have other outside responsibilities, the stress from those outside responsibilities could then impair your judgment. It could impair your ability to really focus on the business. So it's it's a balancing act. And you know I, I think if you're younger and you're living at home with your parents and you have less responsibilities, then you can be a bit more unbridled. You could jump in. Mm -hmm. But if you're uh, in a family and you have dependents, mm -hmm. uh, maybe you just need to be a bit more measured in when you go all in and ma maybe you need more confidence and you need, it, it needs to be able to produce a, a salary or some level of compensation that enables you to meet your obligations. So mm -hmm. I, I do think I have met a lot of entrepreneurs that have gone all in and the stress on their personal life uh, really, really becomes destabilizing for how they're growing their uh, their venture, and ultimately it can lead to decisions that are made that potentially are in haste or unproductive for for where they want to be. Yeah, yeah. No, well said. Um, you know, one of the things you talked about was how important it was in those early days for your employees to be part of all of this. And one of the questions that came in is how do you help employees understand your plans for business growth? So aside from the day to day, how do you bring employees on sort of what the arc and the journey is for the overall business? I think that's a, it's a really, really important one uh, to, to scale and grow. You need to have that level of buy-in and trust and engagement by your team, particularly your early team members that are going to lead the business for the first three, five, seven, ten 10 years. And I've been so fortunate that I've had so many colleagues that have gone above and beyond. And we refer to them as bleeding blue, that mm. they've given so much in a, such a selfless way to Bluestone. But in turn, Bluestone has provided them in some cases, life changing opportunities to be part of something that is scaling, that is growing in different cities and markets where they've traveled, they've, they've performed or they've had opportunities to stretch into new roles. And the three, the three things that I really focus on as founder CEO is certainly the purpose and reinforcing the purpose of why Bluestone, Bluestone came about. It wasn't because I had this need to build a coffee business or that I wanted to transfer out of my previous career. It was solving a unfulfilled need around feeling like I was a local, that I'd walk in and we would make someone feel special. And we would absolutely produce great quality coffee and healthy food, fresh made water food. The second thing is really about um, mastery. So providing your team with opportunities to learn, to grow, stretch projects, uh, opportunities in which they can go lateral, uh, where they've never worked outside of the store, maybe it could be a great opportunity to go into the support center. Maybe it's a fantastic opportunity to go into coffee education or into marketing or a new store open. So that mastery piece is really, really important. And then finally, it's all about autonomy, that, that when someone understands the purpose and the proposition, has worked on the and attained the requisite skills, then they're empowered and they've trusted and they have autonomy to act. And for us, that's that underpins the, the ability to grow. If you're not empowering your team or you don't offer autonomy, you're really going to be stifled. It, it's not going to probably work. You'll, you'll be, you'll slow down in your decision-making and you probably won't be as agile. And what we've seen in the last few years is agility is everything. Yeah. Dealing with COVID, navigating um, when the reopen was happening across different markets with different legislation and rules. And then now, navigating and pivoting with this transformational change in how people work and live, which looks nothing like it did pre-COVID. 
So yeah. for us, um, autonomy and agency is so, so important to keep engagement. And we're focused on those three elements uh, intensely at Bluestone. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe this will, this next question will get into maybe this at a deeper level, but, you know, I think job satisfaction is at such a sort of kind of a tricky point right now. So many people feel like they're not getting any type of joy from their job and a lot of people are disengaged with what they do. So, you know, what have you learned over the past 10 years about what it really means to love your job and how we promote like job satisfaction, not just for ourselves, but for the people around us? Well, I think Bluestone's in a, in a slightly more advantageous position because we are in the hospitality industry and the core tenet to hospitality is to, being, to making someone feel good, being generous with their time, being at their service. So our team, the core ethos is to, to come to work and make someone feel good, to have local thought customers and be part of the team and know your role in the team and be supported in that role. So for us, like, that has been really, really critical that we recruit the right way with teammates that are aligned with that proposition. They, they love hospitality deep down. Um, We've, we invest a lot of time in making sure that we have sessions in which the team can provide feedback and that they can understand what's going on with the business. Mm. That is something that has evolved over, over and, and COVID was a bit of a catalyst for that to invest further in communication. So rather than having just a once a month all hands, we have an all team call every two weeks. We have a newsletter that's distributed weekly that showcases some of the fantastic performance across the business. It, it gives shouts out, shout outs to some of our teammates who receive great reviews. Uh, it will let everyone know about new products or new initiatives that we're launching and the exciting things that are, that are in the future. And I think the communication strategy has changed a lot and that's really helped drive engagement and buy-in and alignment, alignment with the company. But we love and, also, yeah. yeah. And the all team calls, the all team calls that yeah. every single employee at the in Bluestone will join. Yeah, everyone's invited. No, not and everyone enjoy. Uh, uh, yeah, not everyone joins, but the vast majority do. And it's not a session where I really talk at all. Mm -hmm. It's driven by the the broader leaders in the business, which is wonderful. And I, I think, you know, in the early stage of Bluestone, they were probably dominated by myself, which wasn't overly productive. And now it's driven by the team and I go to these calls and I learn myself what's happening, which I think is wonderful and sign of business maturity and the life, you know, at the stage of the lifestyle of the company changing. Yeah. So, but one thing that we, we really also focus on is celebrating the skill and passion of being a barista and having these incredible skills and it is a real um, artistry it's an artisanal skill and so we do barista throwdowns really regularly across all of our nine markets where we compete and uh often i'll attend and i'll lose every time but it's about <laughs> it's about everyone coming together and and showcasing because there is this incredible coffee subculture uh it's it's just yeah. It's a, I didn't probably fully appreciate it until we started Bluestone, but I love those events and everyone comes along and, and showcases what they can do. And it's amazing to just drive that social atmosphere and to feel like we're all part of one team, even though we might be working at different stores and, and in different markets. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Because I think what we're talking about right now is you know, purpose in a lot of ways. And the other thing that I think we've talked about in the past, Nick, is wellness you know, and, and I know that's something that's really important to you to have your own sort of, you know, place of wellness that you can operate in your best possible way. How do you think about that for your team? Yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent question, Neil. I think the first thing is the proposition of the brand, like what we stand for and our products are really high quality. We know exactly where we source from and they're clean. We, we don't, we make our beverages as clean as possible. Of course, you know, sometimes people want to have some vanilla syrup in it or, or sugar, but really we try and make them as pure as possible. And on the food side, we really focus on clean ingredients, uh, fresh ingredients. It, everything's made to order in the store. We don't really have commissaries or packaged items. Uh, so I think leading with that authenticity that we health is really, really important to us. 
but that's that's of course addressing a lot of the physical health but mental health is is probably where our biggest opportunity to to influence communities lays where there's this loneliness epidemic out there this isolation rates of mental health or people feeling like they don't have friends or anyone to go with bluestone lane wants to be an antidote to that we want to bring people together where they feel like they're part of our community where they're a local not customer and you can be feeling really really down but if someone knows your name and gives you that warmth and eye contact it can turn around it can turn it can make you feel instantly like more excited just just more more loved and for us that is just so important and our team facilitate that so you know i think having a really clear understanding of how you make someone feel and then you know for us as as part of the team or leading the business we we talk our teammates all the time about the, the benefits of eating well, obviously we're a daytime, we're a daytime hours concept. So I think a lot of our team enjoy the fact that they finish at four o'clock or three o'clock or five o'clock. We celebrate, we have run clubs, we have partnerships with different fitness studios. We really celebrate mm. uh, making sure you're taking care of your physical and mental health. Yeah. A, a big one when we started was I was quite shocked being Australian, how many, how few people have a paid annual leave and and that's something that we've been pretty generous with uh with our our leaders in each store so you know we want people to go on leave and actually have a good time and uh not not sort of feel like they can't take leave because they're not getting a paycheck and it doesn't apply to everyone in the business and maybe that's something that we would love to offer in the future but but we've been pretty clear with that uh from the very beginning and something that we're, we're going to continue to invest in and hopefully be able to improve those benefits as we get larger. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, um, I love that. And I, and I think that, you know, so much of our mental health, as you're, as you're pointing out, is driven by our work. It's driven by our job. And it's, it's what happens during the workday that can affect us uh, outside of the workday in a profound way. So what have you, you know, what have you learned as a leader when it comes to sort of asking other people for feedback in a way that, you know, allows them to be open. And, and the reason that I'm asking this, Nick, is because one of the things I hear often from business owners is I didn't know that somebody was unhappy, but then all of a sudden they were gone they quit. Right. Yeah. And so how do you as a leader really kind of keep your finger on the pulse and create a space where you can get that like actually open and honest feedback? It's an excellent question because it is a real challenge and it's not something that I profess to be an expert on especially now given we employ seven to 800 teammates. But what I have done or thought about is, is to ensure that I'm investing and allocating at least one day a week where I'm touring stores. Mm-hmm. Because when I go into the store, when I go into the retail environment, I have a chance just to chat casually with the team and observe how, how they're feeling, um, issues that I can address, where they're looking to grow, opportunities that might lie ahead. Uh, and, I, and I find that to be really rewarding because it's hard to get hundreds of people together and yeah. do it, you know, logistically. But I find when I tour stores, I just have an environment where I can catch up and, and people feel, they see that I'm not just someone sitting in the office, that I'm aligned with them, that Bluestone started as one tiny hole in the wall, 200 square feet. <laughs> And that and we don't have this huge hierarchy, hierarchy that we're flat and we're all aligned. And I, and I think to doing what you say you do and, and being open and being extremely humble, I think they're really, really important and providing absolutely encouraging feedback all the time. And that can sometimes be challenging for a leader or a founder in particular, because you, you've got this vision and you think that it should be this way. And there's a lot of feedback that might be challenging that. And you have to, the best you can is respect it and um, take it in, appreciate it. You don't have to act on it, but you've got to give someone the opportunity to express. And, yeah. and that's something that I've, I've focused on over the last, over the journey of the last 10 years. It wasn't something I probably did that well early on, but um, you never know what you you can glean because someone's suggestion might not be applicable for right now at this stage in your life cycle, but in two or three years time, it might've been an amazing insight. And if I look, I think back at 
the proposition before COVID, would I have ever thought that digital would be the way that you order? No, I didn't think that that was aligned to our proposition and who we were, but that all changed and it was necessitated that change because of the conditions. So I, I, I find being with the team and spending time with the team is just so incredibly valuable yeah. and proactively soliciting feedback, having round tables, having, you know, coffee catch ups with the CEO or senior people in the business unlocks so many good insights because the teammates that are serving thousands of locals a week, they have the most incredible uh, insight or just knowledge about things that we could do to improve or ways that we could be more valuable or how we can improve our retention of teammates or retention of yeah. locals. That's great. Well, I think we have time here for one more question and you're kind of transitioning into it perfectly, which is, which is probably the question sometimes, Nick, right? For entrepreneurs, you are in, you know, your tennis of your journey. If you could rewind the clock back one decade and <laughs> pick one thing, one thing that you would do differently, what do you think that might be? Oh, just to pinpoint one is uh, it's quite reasonably challenging. You're throwing me a bit here, but I think ultimately we are Bluestone is where it is, and because it, it's sort of a bit of fate. You know, we could only focus on what we can control, and I think that generally we've done a really good job from that from that aspect. We've pivoted and we've been reasonably agile. I think if anything, I'd look back and say maybe I would do that differently. Is probably when we expanded we probably expanded too aggressively early on and we would have been better to focus in a more concentrated way in our core couple of markets when we expanded to canada in 2019 i think that we went there with a little bit of naivety that it would just be because we went to toronto it was very close geographically to new york mm. the time zone that it would be quite seamless. It's a large city. It has a, a big financial district where we put our coffee shops. It had, a, you know, obviously a large population and suburbs where our core customers lived or reside, resided. But I don't think we understood exactly the challenges with a different currency, with different laws, with supply chain, trying to get coffee beans roasted in New York into Toronto, even though you could you know, put it on a plane and be there in an hour and a bit. Uh, it wasn't that simple. There was tariffs, there was duties, there was a lot more consideration. So if anything, I think we probably just slow down the, the way that we fragmented the business and just concentrated more in a couple of key markets. But, you know, you, you live and learn. And uh, if, if the execution was perfect, then honestly, if we didn't have COVID, I might have have, I might have a different view because so many of these markets uh, became co so constrained or in the case of Toronto, we were on the, the team were able to get into Canada. If you're American or Australian, you couldn't get in. So that made it extremely hard to try and support the team there and, and manage what was essentially, you know, the greatest existential crisis for hospitality or retail businesses that we've ever seen. So, yeah. Well, I love these moments of reflection and I've certainly loved them with you. I, I learn, I learn something new every time we talk. And speaking of which, like we had some great conversations for another series, which is called business class. And for those of you listening, like there's, that's going to be coming out in November, Nick's episode. And, uh, and it's all about uh, how do we prioritize as an entrepreneur, especially when we get pulled in a million different directions as we do. And it's a great episode and Nick has plenty of amazing insights in it. And if you're interested in watching business class, the series as well, the first two episodes are now available. They're on Roku and they're on Amazon prime video. Um, so I also just want to say something that I probably should have said at the top, which applies to all of these, of all these conversations, which is that the topics that we discuss as well as the guests opinions and advice um, are not necessarily reflective of American express business, products, benefits, and services. It's a conversation between us. And, uh, and Nick, I just want to say thank you again for like spending your time with us. I, again, like I can't say it enough. I learn something new from you every time we talk. So thanks for being on the show. Uh, thanks, Sunil. What a, what a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Yeah. And we'll see everybody soon. We're going to be tuning into a weekly episode or cover topics across small businesses. So we'll be back real soon and I will see you then. Thanks a lot. <laughs>